All right, so let's talk about this week really quickly. So you'll see an email coming out. And actually, my hope is we'll have enough time or close to on Wednesday for those of you in class that I can give you your feedback in little 10 to 12 minute sessions on Wednesday. Those of you online, I'm going to set up where we can do Skype sessions and that way we can have feedback a little easier. So there's enough comments and I think that way it, it gives us that a, a really quick feedback piece on our, on our projects and kind of where we're going, what we're up to, where we're at. So you will see an email coming out. I will list kind of my office hours and when might be some appropriate times. So this week, you'll see that we have an assignment. And again, we, we're extending out that Sandia medical case a little bit further. We're also looking then at a discussion board for this week. And that discussion board has to do with a concept we're going to look up here called software as a service, which is a growing trend depending on your business and depending on your, your sector. So we'll talk about that here today really quickly. So this week we've kind of branched out. Now we're looking at, last week we looked at design concepts. Now we're looking at well, what does a modern information system look like? And modern is kind of relative because some companies, due to having to get approval for architectures or other issues, are far behind what we would think of as modern architecture. So we want to look at this environment. And what's interesting is kind of some cyclical concepts that we've seen over the last 25, 30 years where things come and go and they, and they cycle back and forth. So we want to talk about some different types of concepts we want to look at, some different drawing tools. And we want to give you some of those things about protocols. And a lot of this is stuff you've already had in other classes. Again, we're kind of now putting that umbrella approach on it. So when you think about it, so when we talk about things like ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous internet, in other words, that a computer or an internet connection is always available to us. And then we've had security classes where we say, well, that's a great idea, but now it's scary. And why should we go backwards in some cases and get away from that? So. We want to look at all these ideas, and this can hopefully in your, in your project give you some ideas about where we're at. So a couple of pieces, and, and most of you have been exposed to the personal computer. You've seen desktops, you've seen laptops, you've seen tablets, you've seen smartphones, you've seen PDAs, whatever it is you've seen. On the personal side, you've seen those clients. But it's a little more difficult. Most of you probably haven't had a lot of experience on this server side. So where do we get those resources from? So when I go out on a website, where am I going to? And so in our web design class, we force you to create a piece on a server where you're actually creating that content that the browser asks for and brings back. And so you now know that the cloud really isn't anything other than it's something that and somebody else maintains, but it's really not a magic thing. It's a server out there that's being maintained. So if I look at a much bigger scale of company, so if I look at something like Amazon, Amazon has a lot of different servers behind the scenes. And we may find that they have hundreds or thousands of servers. And in fact, this area has been kind of a hotbed for server and, and server farm development. So we haven't got Amazon, but we have Yahoo, and we have Facebook, and we have Google, and several others that are in this area, and within a couple hundred miles. Well, they have multiple servers. And so on the back end, we may see that we offshore to a payment processing server. And so in the case of Peru, if we look at it, we offshore that payment processing to a, a third party company. We don't even do it in house. So as soon as you go to the page to pay for your bill using your credit card, it actually redirects you out to a third party payment site. That payment site then processes it and sends you back to Peru. If you're ordering from our bookstore, we don't own the bookstore, and we won't talk about the good or the bad points about our bookstore right now. There's good points. There really is. They give us a return on our investment, hopefully, and they also provide a few scholarships, but nonetheless, we'll, 
I saw the dirty look. So the same thing. So all of these come out to the internet. And then from our personal side, whether we're uh, computers, desktops, tablets, we go through the internet. We go through the internet to get to that. Well, in a lot of contemporary businesses, we use this same model, whether we're internal or external. We put as much of that software where we can load it directly on a browser versus having to install software. And so that's one of the big differences that we're coming to now. So we're really turning our computers back into the terminals that we had in the 1970s and, and early 80s. So this is what a server farm looks like. And if you go online for Google, you can see what some of Google's farms look like. If you look at Facebook, and Facebook is right now building in Nebraska a $1 billion data center with almost a million square feet up near Omaha, on the outskirts of Omaha. Yahoo has built a very large data center. Over in Council Bluffs, across the river, Google has, this is the only place in the, in the world where Google has actually built two data centers 20 minutes apart from each other. Because the reality was what they were looking for was cheap power, not earthquake prone, and, and various things. So server farms like this hold a lot of databases. And that's one of the reasons we build them. So if I look at Facebook as an example, because everybody's on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, all they are on the back end is really a database. And you are interfacing through that database, whether you realize it or not. All those pictures you store on Instagram are really stored. That image location is actually stored on a database. And so in some cases, we can utilize those resources. We don't have to build our own database farm, we can utilize the resources of something that's already out there. So one of the pieces that I saw several students miss and not talk about when they were, when they were looking at their business, they said, all right, I got a computer. I, I got seven computers, and they're all connected to the internet. And we don't have any discussion about the, the network that's behind the scene there. And that may be as important or more important than anything else. So when you say, I've got seven computers and you're hooked onto the network, well, that doesn't tell me what kind of network you're hooked up to at this business. It doesn't tell me that you've got any safety and security protocols. It may mean you went down to Best Buy or Shopco or Pomida or whatever it's called now, and you bought the cheapest wireless router they could get, and you've got it wide open. And so your network is sitting out there exposed to anybody who parks in a parking stall out front. So that's one of them that I found in several, several different projects that people didn't have anything about. So what about the network? What about the things on the, on the, on the behind the scenes? So the backbone, so that internet backbone, and this is where I worked before I came to Peru, was on this idea of the backbone of, of the internet and the telephony world. So at one point, we used to transport a lot of phone calls. And we still transport them, but now we figured out that we can't charge for it or very much at all because it's such a small chunk of data and we roll them right in. But those high capacity transmission lines are that internet backbone. And right here, we're kind of in the center of the United States. And that's part of the reason that Google and Facebook and Yahoo and several other data centers, PayPal, located where they did. They wanted internet connectivity and be able to get access to those high-speed backbones. Well, most of the time, and I'm going to disagree with our book, they're really not usually owned by the government, which is kind of an oddity. Those are really telecom companies, very large-scale companies. So CenturyLink owns a huge chunk of bandwidth or pipeline in the ground. You have companies like Level 3 Communications, which is now owned by... Century Link. So you'll see a lot of these very large corporations have conduits. And in fact, right out here, just recently last summer, you were probably inconvenienced when you were driving up and down 75 Highway, if you did, because there was construction going on and a company called Zio actually built a new communication line, one of the first ones from um, all the way down at, at uh, Dallas, all the way to Omaha and extending past there. And so they were putting in new fiber optic conduit. But right through this same area, if I go out along 75 Highway out here, is one of the largest communications networks in the world that was owned by Level 3 Communications. 
If I go to the railroad line, you'll see that Sprint and several others are along there. And so those hard, large, high-capacity lines kind of form a backbone across the United States. And they're, they're arranged essentially in big loops from city to city so that there's usually two ways of communication. So if one gets cut, that they can, they can cut that out. So Internet backbone, we've, we've talked about it in other classes. Local area networks, that's inside of our business. And then we have this idea of the World Wide Web. And what I want to tell you, though, is this World Wide Web is all those resources. Everything we need to get out on the world is there. But all kinds of bad stuff is there, too. And so usually in this process, we're going to point out some of those downsides, too. So one of the things to make sure that you do remember out in the future is what a, what a URL is. And that URL doesn't have to be a resource does not have to be a, a resource that is just out on the web. So although we say it's a web resource, this can also be a local-based resource, and it's got a URL, some way we can get to that. So the first thing in here is that header tells us what kind of header it is. And very rarely do we see just HTTP anymore. And in fact, with the latest version of Chrome, every website that just has HTTP is going to be marked as insecure. Because that is, means it's transmitted in clear text. It's not encrypted. And so you'll see that HTTP is going away. So the newest version you're going to see is HTTPS. And anything that you have information that you want to protect, you should be going to HTTPS. The only exception to that is if you're in an internal network only, you can get by with that assuming that you're protecting all your data. But that header, that protocol, that tells us what kind of traffic it is. In this case, it's hypertext transport. So hypertext really just means text with embedded links or links that you can embed in there. This is our server name. So in this case, Amazon.com. So at some point, something points us from Amazon.com to an IP address. And then this is actually that resource name. And so if you think back to your web design class, this is your folder, your subfolder. And this is actually view.html is actually the file name that you are looking for. Past that file name, it's actually passing additional information back into that server so you can refer back to where you are. So we have a lot of different types of software. And what's becoming more important to us, system software, yeah, we really have broiled it down for the most cases. You're either Mac or you're a Windows machine. The reality is there's not a hundred different versions, although depending on how many different variants of Linux, but the Linux makes up such a small version of the desktop that it really doesn't count. It should, because it's got a lot of advantages, but most software hides in either Windows or Mac. Mac being about 10%, Windows being about 90% of the system software. Now, in specific industries, you may find that different, but that's kind of that glue that everything then works on. And so that application software, so Microsoft Word, whatever your program is, if it's QuickBooks, if it's Peachtree, whatever software you have, that application software runs on top of that system software. So that system software has to be installed, and then we can run the application software. So programs that work for the users is the way they describe it. I think about it as the software that gets things done. So another term that you're going to see is that app. And it really just is a shortcut for application. But when we say app, we tend to mean things that run on, in this case, either smartphones, so either on the iOS platform or the Android platform, or tablets, which again are generally based on iOS or, or the tablets. Now you'll see a lot of other ones that exist, things like on TiVo apps and other things. But App tends to, tends to tell us it's on the platform for mobile. Application software tends to be more desktop or laptop based. So you'll see a little bit of difference there. Both Microsoft and Apple are working very hard to push the idea that we can write the same code that will run on both apps, or run as an app on a phone, and run on a desktop. And they're trying to merge those together. So far, so far that's not been very successful in most cases. And in fact, we did have a lot of effort through Microsoft 
How many of you, though, have bought a Microsoft Windows phone? Or can you even now? No. Their plans kind of fell down. So they've tried a couple different models, and so far that hasn't worked really well. Microsoft now is, is working a lot on the Android side, trying to figure that out, which means they have to work with their buddies, Google. So it's kind of an interesting mix. But apps, and in fact, next week you'll see that we are going to force you to build an app, is usually for those smart mobile devices. So depending on your need, you may well think, all right, I need an application piece of software that will run as an app, so I really need it to run on a, on a smartphone. So as an example, my wife works for something called the CCFL, Center for Families and Law, part of UNL, and they train health and human service workers. Well, they're trying to figure out, much like everybody else, how to cut costs. Traditionally, for all these health and human service workers they train, those child protective service workers in the state, they've printed out lots and lots of documents called job aids that give them literally step-by-step -step how to perform their jobs. So it's kind of like a flow chart saying if A, do B. Well, what they are trying to do, because printing we know is expensive, or if you don't, you should by now. Printing gets very expensive. What they are trying to do now is put those into a form of an app so all of those health and human service workers can get their, their same idea, that job aid, on an app, and they can view it, and in this case, maybe make multiple choices on it. Well, there's a couple of other advantages versus a printed document. If the legislature makes a change, or there is a legislative change in some manner, then it can be changed in that app very quickly, and those health and human service workers have access to changed documents instead of handing them a change to a memo. And so I didn't realize how in like state government how some of that is truly bizarre, but my wife pointed out the other day on a the original idea from the state government was six sentences long for the health and human services. The last memo that they have to interpret and train their employees on was 74 pages full of memo about the six sentences. And it contradicts itself in there and makes all kinds of things. So they can now push that off into an app. We don't have to print. People get information quicker. So a lot of times, we think about creating an app for us. And there are a ton of tools out there. In fact, we're gonna, like I said, we're going to look at, at one of them. So again, this is that same idea. Now we look at this software, and we look at all these devices here. It doesn't matter except in terms of output whether we come in as a desktop, a, a phone. So we do need to think about plugins and things. If you have an app that still depends on Microsoft Aptic X, yikes, probably should think about updating. So you do have to worry about security and implications on there. But what we're trying to do is create more browser-specific items so that we don't have to create something that runs on, the, on this personal computer. It runs on a tablet. We're just going to a web address, and it magically contains all that information. That's, that's the trend that we're going to. Well, if I flink back, back into the 70s, we used to see these giant terminals. Well, that's, we're really kind of going backwards a little bit there. So, so web-based applications are really, really common. Think about my PSC. You don't have to download anything for my PSC to get in and add classes or change your, the classes you're in or do a degree audit. So everything is accessed through that URL. We use standard security. We use standard protocols. If I have specific needs, and there are some, so maybe I need to run video and I can't figure out any other way to do it. Maybe I have a plugin that I have to add to my browser. So you'll see those. The reality is it'd be lovely and great if the world could live without any kind of those embedded pieces that we had to add into our browser. Unfortunately, we live in a world where that isn't the case. So you'll see that a lot of times you end up with things like for Adobe, Acrobat Reader extensions and some things like that. So it, it would be nice, but we're not going to get quite there. So a couple more terms you're going to see. So the, the word protocol is that language that allows us to communicate together. So when I see protocol, so I can always think back and, and remember if I, man, what's protocol? Remember back to Star Wars, and they called them protocol droids, language droids, some way that we can communicate between them. 
So if I want to communicate, I need the same language. So think about that when you were in a very interconnected world. Well, our computers have to be able to communicate on the same language, just as though we need to pick a common reference language when, when we're talking to somebody. So a lot of times we end up with using, for example, in the airline industry, we standardized on English, but other thoughts are in science. A lot of times we actually have standardized on German, for example. So network protocol. So one of the things that several of you, I'm probably going to have this discussion about, is creating something called a VPN. So a VPN really just says, all right, I'm going to create a connection, but I'm going to make it private. So I'm going to go through the public internet, but I'm going to create a tunnel. I'm going to create an encrypted channel where I can communicate. So doctors will use a VPN to connect back into the medical services at a hospital. That way that information is private and it's very secure and we can connect offices together using VPNs or we can connect a single individual back in. It really gives us some great tools to work with where we can look like we're on the same network as if we are in the business, but we can do it remotely. So it's a great tool. Again, now we're looking at, if you look at this diagram, so now we've got this idea of protocol types. In other words, on that network, we all have to have the same types from the web, from program to program. And sometimes you're going to run into programs that don't like to speak to each other. And I saw that a lot in the medical field. Programs that don't like to speak to each other. Everybody has a proprietary output format or input format. And so in some cases, you pay a significant amount of money so that you can create some kind of a conversion so that you can have all these things connected. In an ideal world, we'd have these open standards, and we create a lot of them. So XML is an idea. XML says we can create our own container language. But again, some of this legacy software that's been around and just tweaked for you know, 20, 30 years doesn't always, doesn't always like that, and we can't always get there. So you'll see a lot of different pieces HTML, so that's really our websites. HTML, so with HTML you'll also see CSS, which is a formatting piece. And both of those are really, really then excerpts out of XML, that extensible markup language. So in other words, we define what things are and we use those tags that you've seen before. So you'll see HTTP and HTTPS. So again, HTTPS is that encrypted portion. So web documents, which a lot of our world traffic now is, is floating around under HTTPS. So when we start looking at this then from that big picture side, we need to think about how do I design that technology? How do I design their network system? How do I design their system software? How do I look at what's already there and how do I modify it? And one of the trends that's really happening a lot, that's really popular right now, is this idea of software as a service. So software as a service primarily says nothing's installed. Now, there are some exceptions to that that install a small plug-in. But the application service, we get to it remotely. We don't know where it's stored in a lot of cases. User data is stored on common servers. So Blackboard is a great example of a software as a service for Peru. We don't own the server where Blackboard lives. And in fact, it's housed on a server farm in Virginia along with hundreds and thousands of other institutions where we purchase amount of bandwidth, in other words, how much data students are going to upload, and how much storage we capacity we have on that machine. And we purchase that. And there's some realities that are really great because we don't have to then have somebody on call 24 hours a day if something happens. That makes a lot of sense. So our upfront cost is less. We don't have to purchase the servers. We don't have to purchase the bandwidth. So we're doing that in chunks. It allows us to grow as we need to. So if suddenly next year we went from 2,000 students to 10,000, which A, we'd have a problem with that, but if we suddenly went to 10,000 students, we would have the ability to scale up or to scale down if suddenly 
we drop to 1,000 students, we'd be able to scale those software as a service application. So they're a really great way to start out. Now, in a lot of cases, we run the math and we will find a break-even point where we say at X number of students, it would be cheaper for us to buy the servers and buy the bandwidth and buy the capacity and do that. And that often is, is the case. So email is a great example of that. Microsoft Exchange email is very expensive in terms of licensing. So several years ago, I worked with a hospital that needed to upgrade their licensing and their servers for Microsoft Outlook email, so Exchange email services. We spent $89,000 for licensing and hardware to get them up and functional for 20 or uh, 200 email accounts. Well, that's a lot of money. I can get a free email account. Why would I not just get a free email account? Well, it probably doesn't look really good for, for some reason for the doctor to be emailing off of a Hotmail account. That would make me a little scared. But we know that we could host it also with Microsoft having servers. The reality was the board and other people who were in charge at that point in charge of the funding didn't understand how I can make email secure that lives out on the web, that they don't have physical control over. We don't have those machines here. But the reality is, because that's not a primary job for those IT staff, when they need to do maintenance or something on an Exchange server, which is very, very user intensive, they sometimes have to contract out because it's not something they do every day. It's not their skill, their expertise. Whereas if they would have hosted it with a service that that's all they do, they have that that competency in that area. And in fact, when we ran the numbers, trying to see where it became cost effective, and again, this was several years ago, so I don't know what the exact numbers are now, but we found a break-even point of it would be cheaper for us to host our own email and build our own servers versus host it at around 15,000 users. So had we had 15,000 plus users, it would have made sense to own our own Exchange server. The reality was, because of political climates, we ended up doing it in that particular place for 200 users. So sometimes, even though we could point out the economics of it, it didn't make, make sense for them. On the other hand, I think more and more people now are understanding the power of the quote unquote cloud, which is really, again, that means it's a server that somebody else controls. And now we can see that we can do a lot of this stuff within a web browser. And in fact, your student email is a great example of that idea of a web service. You don't have to install Outlook or Exchange or any other software. Your email, you just go to on a web standard. You go, I'm going to type in whatever your peru.edu email is. I can access it. I can send email. I can receive email. Everything I can do goes through a web browser. And I can do that on my phone, I can do that on my tablet, I can do that on a desktop, and it works really well. Now, on your phone, you can actually install, and some people have, you can install it a little differently where it runs as an app, and there's some advantages to that on a phone in terms of receiving data, not having to log in all the time, because that login details are, are then obfuscated from you. But that idea of putting everything on a web service makes a lot of sense. We don't have to deal with things like backup. So when we do this, we're really talking about a client-server architecture, but extending that out onto the World Wide Web. So traditionally, so for example, in this lab, we have a client-server type of operation. We have some stuff that's stored on the server. So in this case, your shared student drive stored on a server. We have a client. So when you go to that shared drive, you're requesting to go to the resource that's stored on that server. If we still had printers, that would be a, a resource then that the server was connected to, and you would send a document through that server to the printer. Now, because of the cost of printing, you don't see printers in here anymore because it was too expensive for us to do that after our, our college went on to a, a different system. So. We traditionally look at this as a three-layer architecture. Blah. So let's look at that. So that three-layer, so that view layer, is what you see. 
So the reports, the screens you see. The domain layer, that's that business rule. So that's that web application. So that's my email interface. That's my QuickBooks web sign. That's that intermediate layer that processes business rules. And then it connects to that data layer. That's where the database lives or the data stores. And in most cases, we don't see that database. We only see that domain layer at most, and we see that it connects in. We see the business rules, and so as business analysts, that's kind of where most people tend to live, is you're between what the end user sees, and you're behind the, between the SQL programmers, or the database administrators, whatever you have, and you're creating then, you're taking that business logic, and you're converting that into how is it going to work on that database server, so you're in that middleman position. So that's our, our typical three-layer architecture that you're going to see. So one of the things we look at when we go into a business and we look at this idea is we have something called interoperability. So how does this application act with other software? Does it interact? So what do we want to do? We do want to reuse pieces if we can. We want to build where the user logs into one system versus many. So I am actually working with a friend of mine right now in an insurance agency trying to come up with a way for them to do this. Because right now, they have a very convoluted path. They're an independent insurance agency, not a single line. So it's not State Farm where all the insurance comes from State Farm. They have probably 10 different insurance companies that they work with. And so if you walk in the door and you say, hey, I'd like to get an insurance quote for my car, they don't have any way to just put it in one screen and get insurance quotes from all 10 different insurance companies that they work with. They have to go to auto owners and check. And they've got to go to Progressive and check. And they have to go to Geico and check. And so what they don't have is any interoperability. There are companies that have built software for insurance companies that claim that they do, and we're actually having them evaluate a couple of those right now. They're not cheap, unfortunately, but it gives them the ability to go out and reach out to multiple insurance companies. And so they also have single forms. So instead of having forms that change from each insurance company, they get on and they would use a single form. And so it's reusing some of that existing pieces. And then they also will store a lot of other information. So it's that idea of how do, I, how do I connect all those dots together. Now luckily, all of their insurance companies that they work with now really are web-based. They go to a web browser and they get all the information about it and they send information back and forth to that server and they don't have to install any software to be able to do that. So they can work from essentially any browser and they can do that. So they do have the idea of software as a service now we're looking at how do I make it more useful and more usable. So in our in our book example, one of the things that we have to deal with or think about is where is all this software, hardware, users, and different things installed? Why why would we install our data center in one location versus another? Why do we build in council blocks? versus, hey, you know what, we should probably put our data center in, let's say, downtown San Francisco. That's where all the, the really techie people are at, are in downtown San Francisco, right? But is it more expensive to, to have a building in San Francisco than Council Bluffs? Significantly more expensive. And so we'll pick on JB. Orlando seems like a really great town to build something, a data center. What's the problem with building something in, in Florida? What do you guys have every once in a while down there that we don't have to worry about here? Hurricanes. Caught you with your mouth full there, did I? Died. So we have to balance that. The other reality is in California, is electricity expensive? Is it really cheap in the Midwest? And in fact, is it cheaper other places? The reality is most of those data centers have huge cooling needs. It, it takes far more energy to cool everything 
than any other than any other aspect. So you're actually seeing some are being built in very cool climates where they can hopefully mitigate some of that. Or they're selling off the heat buildup in some cities off to heat buildings and do different things. So where are people, places, and resources going to be? And so in your study, most of yours are smaller businesses, so you may not have to deal with this issue of where different organizations and different things are placed. But even to the effect of what happens about time zones. And so I need to think about that when I'm starting to deal with people and places. And then you even have weird things. What if, what's weird about Arizona and time zones? What does Arizona not do? Yeah, they don't. They don't look at at that uh, time change. So part of the year they're the same time as you. Part of the time they don't. If you go up into Michigan, there are some counties that don't do it. And so we have to worry about how do we get everybody synchronized. And it can and it can be very very interesting. So here we have a diagram of a typical business or what we would hope to think of as a typical business. So we've got all these applications that are very, very data driven. We've put them out on the software as a service so we don't host very much anymore. And our business has some other things we need to deal with. So in this particular case, what we've tried to do is minimize the ability of a single component failure so notice we a lot of times we have multiple internet service providers. So at our college, we have the same internet service provider, but we have two distinct pathways back to UNL where we get our internet from. So if one system gets hit, we can use the other one. Most businesses that have really high data needs start to look at this. But when I look at smaller businesses, even though they may be affected greatly, the thought of them having to pay for two internet connections, well, why do I pay for something that I'm never going to use? Do you know you're never going to use it? What happens when you're relying on what used to be Time Warner Cable, and they get cut, and they have in the last year fairly repeatedly in Lincoln, and it takes out all of their communications in Southeast. And if you're depending on that for your phone system and your data, your business may not be open that day. So we have we look at redundant connections. A lot of times people want public Wi-Fi access. So in this case, notice we've got that Wi-Fi access in front of the firewall. So out there by the web servers, those data storage that we're going to send out to people, and we we keep all of our the rest of our items. So our content, our application, our database, we keep that behind a really robust firewall. And when I say a robust firewall, I'm not talking about the $39 Linksys device that you bought at, at Shopco again, that we have some, some actual real security in there. And so that's one I have been pushing for a lot of people to realize is how important this idea that firewall is and not bury things behind some little device they found at Best Buy or Shopco. Uh, a really good firewall, for example, if we use something like a Meraki firewall that actually gets updates every hour or every two hours, what it can do is provide more closer to real-time protection. So as soon as in the world, that network operations center for Meraki, which is part of Cisco Networks, as soon as they realize, hey, there is an issue somewhere in the Ukraine, we have some bad IP addresses, that rules get sent down to your router and your firewall and will block that in real time. Or we notice there's a new piece of ransomware. We can block that in more real time. If I buy just the standard $30 filter, well, those things don't get deployed and changed ever in most cases. So that gives us a way to, to deal with that. Now, I will say that there are some problems with this. Well, one of them I see is there's a lot of points of what we'd call single point of failure. So if that switch back there that feeds off the application database servers, in most cases, we'll have some redundant hardware and software. So our storage switch back here, we would generally have redundant pieces here. So we try to make everything as redundant as possible. In other words, if one piece of hardware or software dies, that our entire system doesn't go down. So we're looking for that 
in terms of a way. So a lot of times, a lot of times then we start to create these deployment diagrams. So here we have an active server page or ASP server on Microsoft. And so we can look and see how this works. So our customer account, order fulfillment, all go into the sales subsystem. That then is all based on, so notice we say it's on based on SQL protocols or structured query language of a Microsoft SQL server. Do we need to identify it as a Microsoft Circle SQL server or can we just say SQL server? Has Microsoft got any proprietary commands and language? Yeah. And in fact, what you'll find is if it's on something like DB2 or Microsoft SQL or Postgres or any of the other hundreds of different SQLs, that there are differences in how they'll work. So detailing that is pretty important. So a schema then is really just our how do we have those tables arranged? So our tables for orders, products, customers. So a schema is really just a plan. So if we're making a schema for this weekend's activities, we're just making a plan for this weekend's activities. So a lot of times we go in and we look at what's existing, and then we can think about how we can change what's actually there, and how do we make it better? What do we think about? So what's in our environment? What's the operating systems? What system software are we using? What network pieces do we have? So we may find out that one of the issues they seem to have in our business is, you know what, we have customers and they get on our network and they complain it's really, really slow. And you find out that they have a wireless router plugged in that's doing nothing more than hosting all your network so they can see everything. And it's from, you know, 2002. Older standards are much slower and maybe we have to think about spending some money. Maybe we need to think about security which is kind of, I, I preach a lot about security, but the reality is one security breach can take out a small company really, really easily. And they can be very expensive to try to recover from that. If you lose all your clients' data in a small town, it's going to be hard to get new clients in a small town where everybody talks to each other. If you're a small physician's office and you've lost everybody's medical records, great. Now we know everybody in town who's got what disease, but it's going to be pretty hard to get people to come in there. Or if you're the insurance agency and you happen to lose all their information. People are, are becoming more aware of that and they're starting, starting to get there. So things that you can look at when you start looking at that environment a little more in depth, and that's where we're going we're gonna to go, is what kind of security are they using? Are they building an API? So an API is really that software interface. So do I need one? What kind of things do I need? What clients do I need? So if I have built or are using some kind of SaaS software or even internal software that, that pushes out a web page, but it's only going to work on a Windows machine, then I look around and they're all using Macs. I've done something really, really, really wrong in that environment. So I need to think about what, what changes I can make. And you'll find that there's people that have done those kinds of things. So here's a typical environment. So we have all kinds of workstations. And notice we're still on 100 meg per second LANs. That's really, really common. We have all these devices. We have a firewall to customers. And so we need to figure out and so notice on the back end, we, we actually do have some, some gigabit. And so we need to think about how we can improve this. So here we have that idea of that VPN. So manufacturing and distribution, it creates a VPN tunnel. The retail stores, it creates a VPN tunnel. So anytime I have multiple locations, that idea of a VPN becomes really, really critical. How do I get my information from one place to the other? So this is fairly typical of things that we know are happening in most businesses. More mobile. 
more apps, more ubiquitous computing. We need to figure out how to deal with companies and the web out there. How do I deal with it? More things are hosted on the web than ever before. We also have this idea of social networking and all these apps that want to interact with it. How do I deal with that? And in the midst of that, we know that social networking is the complete opposite of security. How do I, how do I start to deal with that? And some of that is policy. Employees stay the hell off Facebook during business hours, but maybe we have to have a social app from Facebook because that's where we advertise. Great. So we're seeing more and more businesses having that external. In other words, they're using that software as a service. They're moving their operations from in-house to out onto the web because they don't have to have that infrastructure development. They can, in some cases, get it developed or a piece developed for them. It lives outside of their environment, and they don't have to deal with it on a daily basis. We, we can reallocate, in some cases, office space back into what used to be a server closets. We don't have to have that every three to five year server upgrades. So in a lot of ways, this really works, works great. So this is the updated version then. So now one of the things you see is all of the different areas now are on gigabit land. And actually, internally, from all of our web servers, database, application, internally, they may now be on a much faster, on a 10 or 40 or 100 gigabit LAN. So in other words, they've gotten much faster speeds internally, which is going to benefit everybody that connects into them. We have much faster connections through the VPNs. And we're probably buying much bigger internet pipelines than we used to. There are areas where you're still limited, where you may only be able to get DSL at 1.5 megs per second. But they're becoming smaller and smaller. Businesses are choosing their locations where they can get very large pipelines. I have gigabit Ethernet in my house in Auburn, Nebraska, for crying out loud. It's possible. You just may have to, to do some looking and some searching for alternative solutions, other companies. And in some cases, you may have to physically move your office if it doesn't have the speed in places you need. It's sad, but that's the reality, and businesses are changing based on can I get high-speed connection? Because if I want to run my business, I need to have all these pieces. So here we have all different kinds of things, because they're dealing with the internet and the web a lot more. So now we have payment servers, app stores, social network pieces. Because everything needs to be secure, now we're actually hosting our own certificate server to issue our certificates out because we have that much client traffic. And so that's, that's something that's, that's new and a little different. And so you'll notice those ones that face the web, they have to set outside of our firewall. They're setting out here directly out onto the internet, out onto the scary, scary internet. And that, that is kind of a fairly common arrangement you're going to see something like that. So. We've examined our network. We've looked at it. We've seen what's out there in the world. We have an idea. Now we need to think, how do I start to look at, how do I start to reconfigure? So that idea, that same thing we used before, those use cases, now we can start to say, where do they start to land in our, in our thing? So here we have the use case of a phone sale. Same people, nothing's changed, so we're still using phone sales reps. We still have the domain classes and events, but now we can start group them into where they're going to land and whether those applications are going to land internal or external. And so you notice we have different groups. We can now change our, our three-layer domain just a little differently. So now all of our use cases lay in that middle. So here you'll see that we have web pages for customer view, phone sales, shipping rep. So we're starting to change our architecture a little bit but as a back end, we're still using that, that SQL database. But it's the middle layers we're going to change. That database, we're probably going to not change the structure tremendously. Hopefully it was laid out correct originally. Are we going to add tables and additional pieces? Yes. But are we going to change that original architecture? Well, probably not, because we've already got a giant legacy of systems that interact with it. So starting from scratch is going to be very expensive, but we can add additional pieces. So this kind of shows how all of these different pieces flow in. So 
that trade show app that we wrote flows into supply chain management. Because notice through inventory items, and we also have this consolidated sales and marketing now. So all of those then flow into financial planning. So we can look at how those subsystems interrelate and at which ones we can add. So this, then we can look at that data. Who owns it in terms of storing it, managing it, researching it? And a lot of times we end up with a couple of weird things. So if you'll notice here, our inventory, notice this is a copy that goes out to the, to the trade show. It only gets a nightly update. But over here, our inventory for supply chain management gets an hourly update out of this inventory master. So in other words, we're not pushing data all day long to those people on the buying end. But we are pushing it out at a fairly regular basis into that supply chain management system, that thing that handles purchasing from vendors, that handles our inventory. Whereas our master system, setting up here, is, is updated on a real-time basis as people order. So we know that those data systems are big enough that we can't monitor every transaction. We also don't have in here, we may spin off data farms or pieces of that data so that we can use it for research. So we may take that marketing data and we may spin it off into a data store separately. And that may get used for doing some of that research where we're looking for correlations between sales, where we're doing that data mining, some of those buzzwords you've heard about that, where we're looking into that data and going, what kind of connections can I make? How can I better treat my customers? Do I notice that the same customers that own Lexuses are buying a lot of high-end jackets, or maybe they're buying skis, or whatever it is we're selling, how do I start to make that connection? And how do I start looking at it? Maybe I see some connection between customers who are born in February, and I have a better marketing effort because I know that those customers are born in February, that they buy a certain type of product. Now, we know that there's some things that we know are, are fairly typical in business, but we want to get behind them. We know that our sales are going to increase before Christmas, but maybe we have a bump in sales at the end of February. Why, would, why could we have a bump in sales at the end of February? What do, what do people get in the spring? So, no, go ahead. Go ahead. What, what do people get in the spring in a lot of cases? So they've paid all year long into this horrible governmental agency they get an income tax refund. And so if I'm a car dealer, for example, I know that I can bump my sales up by tackling those people who use their income tax refund as a savings plan. And I can, I can look at that. So that's that idea of that data mining. So once I build that architecture out and I see where I'm at, then I can use it to my advantage. I can, I can consolidate all this data and I can do that. So in my example in the insurance company, Part of the reason we want to do that is we want to keep a better idea of not only being able to quote across 10 different agencies or whatever they end up doing, but to keep better track of their customers, to do that idea of a CRM, customer relationship management. So even things like birthdays and anniversaries and those kinds of things, you could send out a very simple email saying, hey, congratulations, I see you've been married 12 years. Those kinds of handy things. Now, Sometimes they go badly wrong when you mail that out to the couple that just got divorced. But, but even those things like birthdays, they generally don't change. And I still get offers out of some of the places I've done business based on my birthday. They've got a CRM system in, and they send me things. Every year for my birthday, since 1998, so however many years that is, it's a long time, I have gotten a bouquet of flowers on my birthday from a car dealership. I bought a truck in in 1998, actually from Fort Pierce, Florida, out along the coast, and they have sent me flowers. I had a great experience buying the truck, and quite frankly, if I decide to go buy a truck similar to that, I might well give them the business because I you know I could fly out and drive the truck home or whatever. Does it cost them some money in that? Yes, but it's that idea of now they've, they've got a little bit of a handle in there. And so the insurance company I'm working with is wanting to do something similar. They're probably not going to send out flowers, but certainly it would allow them to track their clients better and their business clients better. So we could see that 
Amber has car insurance, but doesn't seem to have health and life insurance with us. So maybe we could then target her for, hey, we notice you have car insurance. We could save you money if you had car and health and life insurance with us. Those kinds of things. So that idea of consolidating that data and creating it inter to an interoperable state really makes a lot of sense. So you will see I'm going to send out an email. And I wish I had a great way that you guys could interact with my email system and my scheduling. But I've tried several different things, and nothing seems to really work very well. So for the size of this class, I'm just going to shoot out kind of my schedule and tell you what might be some great times. And so we'll set up some, for those of you online, some Skype sessions. For most of you, we should be able to get through it here in class in, a, in, that, in next Wednesday. So we'll probably set up here after I quit recording some like tentative times in class so you're not waiting the entire hour and 15 minutes. But 